Hi, I'm Nancy Lewis, Scotty Smack Shakes, Scott with Tarot Part 2 Live and Direct, and I just opened up my YouTube, and I just came across this video, it's 11 minutes long, and uh, what I'm just starting to do, bro, is every time I put something on interesting that I want to watch, I'm just turning my computer on and uh, make a reaction and doing whatever the fuck I do. So if you want to join me and listen to it with me, man, click subscribe, hit a like, drop a comment, all that good shit, man. I'm very grateful to be alive, grateful to be here. I can relate. Fuck, man. I got trial in October, so I don't know, man. We'll see what's going on, bro. High school dropout turned one billion dollar drug kingpin before the age of 30, bro. 30. I just turned 30, bro. Okay, let's see. To me, that it was a billion dollars worth of drugs. Prosecutors tell me he was basically supplying the entire eastern seaboard of the United States uh, with with, uh, with the marijuana. And these were going every week. They stopped one uh, jet, and I think it was like five million dollars. With, with, with cash, filled with cash. This is the remarkable story of Jimmy Cornwallier. Five million dollars in cash, just one. Now 34 years old. Welcome back to Hot TV 416. In this video, we're going to take a look at the most unbelievable rags to riches story you've never heard of. It's the story of how a young kid from Montreal went from a high school dropout. His bro. mother was on. Bro, do you know how close that is, man? I'm like fucking seven hours from Montreal. I've been to Montreal tons of times. Crazy Canadian. On welfare to a drug kingpin who oversaw a billion dollar empire by the time he was 30. An empire which worked directly with the Hells Angels, multiple Italian mafia families, and even El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel. That kid, Jimmy Cornwallier, smuggled over 240,000 pounds of high-grade Canadian marijuana into New York City, using trucks, fishing boats, and even snowmobiles. New York officials even admitted that they had never seen anyone do it as big as Jimmy. He was filthy <laughs> rich, drove a $2 million Bugatti, had a Brazilian girlfriend, and partied with celebrities like his friend. UFC star George St. Pierre, and A-list actors like Leonardo DiCaprio. In this video, we're going to take a look at the unbelievable story of Jimmy Cornwallier, the high school dropout turned billion dollar drug kingpin. I promise you, this is one video you have to watch. Jimmy Cornwallier was born in 1979, to a middle class family- Bro, what the fuck? Man, I just said that in my head. I know you guys don't- I probably don't believe me bro, but like, born 22, what the fuck is going on man? From Montreal. So, I'm um, gonna connect that 123. 123, we here, man. I wonder if I heard about this shit. I must have. But I don't know how I could have somehow in my brain thought 1979. Jimmy had what seemed like a relatively normal childhood and was described as a talented athlete growing up. That was until an unfortunate series of events changed Jimmy's life forever. One day, when he was 16, Jimmy's father walked out on the family. His father's construction company had failed, and, not knowing what to do, Jimmy's father panicked, and ran. The only thing his father left behind was a series of personal letters, that he had written to his wife, and two sons. With his father gone, Jimmy's mother fell into a deep depression, and eventually lost her own dry cleaning business. With nobody left to support the family, the Cornwallis fell on hard times. Jimmy's mother was forced to go on welfare. She also moved Jimmy and his younger brother, Joey, into their uncle's apartment. But, while living there, Jimmy's uncle committed suicide. Jimmy's mother, who was still battling- Damn. Can relate, bro. I attempted suicide, bro, just over a year ago. I'm grateful I'm here, man. This is the fucking... Since my trials and tribulations, bro, like... I was in a house, bro, you know? And, uh... Anyways, man, I fucking, yeah, <sighs> to my babies, to my kids, I love you and I will see you soon. Daddy's getting better. In depression, also attempted suicide several times herself. This unfortunate series of events, his father leaving him, his mother's downward spiral, and the family's money problems, had a profound impact on Jimmy. Although he couldn't fix the first two problems, Jimmy was going to make sure that money would never be an issue again. So, Jimmy dropped out of high school to start his own business, and it wasn't a construction or dry cleaning company like his parents. Jimmy's business was marijuana, and, as he would learn later on, there were literal plane loads of money to be made selling this stuff. When Jimmy started off, he was a terrible drug dealer, and got arrested three times in four years. Nobody was there to show Jimmy the ropes, or teach him the tricks of the trade. That's part of what makes Jimmy's story so remarkable. 
Jimmy actually started from the bottom. He had no help from anybody. It was only through sheer ambition that Jimmy would start from the bottom, eventually learn the ins and outs of the drug game, and climb up the ladder to kingpin status, working alongside the Hells Angels, the Rizzuto and Bonanno crime families, and El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel. I put it down to him being highly motivated, uh, very disciplined, and uh, ambitious and charming. With each of Jimmy's arrests, you can literally see him climbing up the ladder, as the amount of drugs and money involved gets bigger and bigger. He went from being arrested with 11 marijuana plants, to a jeep full of marijuana, to 10,000 ecstasy pills. All within the span of four years. Seeing how many times he was arrested, you would think, that Jimmy was an idiot. But Jimmy very quickly learned an important lesson. His mistake was that he was directly handling the drugs, and getting his hands dirty. Jimmy realized then, that he needed to keep the drugs at arm's length. So, he reorganized his drug operation. Jimmy then began recruiting criminals who would handle the dirty work for him, which included the transportation, sale, and distribution of the drugs. This way, Jimmy kept his hands clean, and insulated himself from future arrest. He recruited his girlfriend's brother. He also recruited another Montreal man named Patrick Pace. By recruiting Pace, Jimmy gained- <laughs> Look at that dumb fucking early 2000s. <laughs> Look at the necklace. Access to him. The hair, bro. You just see the style. It's funny. Put you back to those times. His contacts in the Hells Angels and local native smugglers who lived on reserves along the US Canada border. With these new contacts, Jimmy now had a cross border distribution channel, meaning he could start selling his marijuana in the much larger and more lucrative drug market on the east coast of the United States. But, Jimmy came from the school of hard knocks and still had a few painful lessons to learn before he could expand his operation. An early mistake that Jimmy made threatened to destroy his young operation before it even lifted off the ground. One November day, in 2004, Jimmy was driving his brand new Porsche Cayenne through Quebec's cottage country. Despite the winter weather, Jimmy was pushing the luxury SUV over 140 kilometers an hour before he lost control of the vehicle and crashed. The crash killed his 24-year-old friend and passenger. Jimmy was charged with serious driving offenses, including dangerous driving causing death. To make matters worse, Jimmy was out on bail at the time, as he was still facing charges stemming from when Holy. he was caught with the 10,000 ecstasy pills. In 2005, Jimmy would start serving a combined 82-month prison sentence for both the driving and ecstasy cases. With Jimmy behind bars, he had to rely on his associate, Patrick Pace, to run the operation. However, Pace wasn't as smart or charismatic as Jimmy, and almost destroyed everything. While Pace was running the operation, a million dollar deal he set up with a Brooklyn-based distributor went terribly wrong, after the distributor ran off with the drugs. This left Jimmy- Wow. Got him for a million bucks. Jimmy and Pace in debt to the Hells Angels, who had money invested in the deal. Pace wasn't able to take care of business. It wasn't until Jimmy was later released to a halfway house, in February 2007, that he not only managed to smooth things out with the Angels, but started really expanding the operation. And it wasn't until he got out of prison um, that uh, he, he, he was able to settle it all. He's, you know, he met with the, with the bikers and he you know, came to terms with you know, this and that and settled all the debts and got things back on track. Prison only served as a minor speed bump on Jimmy's road to riches. While sitting in prison, Jimmy took the time to once again learn from his mistakes. He realized that he needed to be more cautious and make sure his operation was as airtight as possible. After Jimmy got out of prison, he did some major spring cleaning. Not only did Jimmy continue keeping his hands off the drugs, he now forced everyone in his organization to start using encrypted BlackBerry phones, set up a fake job as a ready-made alibi, and stuck to driving his girlfriend's low-profile SUV instead Something about it. Jobs. He now forced everyone in his organization to start using anchor tip BlackBerry phones. Anchor tip. I don't know what that is. But. Set up a fake job as a ready made alibi and stuck to driving his girlfriend's low profile SUV instead of his usual high end sports cars. As a matter of fact, Jimmy was so intent on never being arrested again that he reportedly set aside $2 million as a head fund. We're talking a literal fund that Jimmy would draw money from in order to pay for hits on people he thought could hurt him. And it's also true that on your Blackberry that was seized during one of the arrests, there were texts saying that you kept a $2 million slush fund to pay for the murder of anyone who crossed you, right? Yeah, there were texts that said that, but that was just talk. 
But, Jimmy's new level of discipline and focus would pay off, and his operation would finally take flight. Jimmy built a $1 billion empire, before he turned 30 years old, and had the type of lifestyle, that many 20-somethings could only ever dream of. Jimmy's operation was complex, and, as we'll see, involved working directly with some of the biggest crime organizations in North America. The first step of Jimmy's operation started in British Columbia, where he would source the world-famous marijuana known as BC Bud. From the west coast, the Hells Angels would transport truckloads of BC Bud to Montreal, where it would then be warehoused. Okay, so... Okay, yeah, because this is Canada. This is British Columbia. This is Montreal. Okay. This is a boat, a snowmobile across the border. Wow. That's so funny. Whoever drew this graph, man, shout out to you. Once in Montreal, native smugglers who lived on reserves along the US-Canada border would smuggle the BC bud over the border. In the summertime, the smugglers did this using small fishing boats. In the wintertime, they used snowmobiles. Once in the US, the BC bud would then make its way to New York City, where it would be warehoused, and, with the help of the infamous Bonanno crime family, eventually wholesale to high-end distributors in New York. Probably drive like right to these like, uh, rural areas, like, you could drive to where I'm at, and like an hour from where I'm at is the America. It's just uh, in Maine. And there's like no fence in Maine, you know what I mean? Like there's a, uh, yeah bro, you can, I remember when I was a kid, I was up there um, and we were in a place and we, we drove and we were in the boat and we went from Canada to America in the boat. And you know, we crossed the border, nothing, nobody said nothing. It was through this river, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's still available. You would think that such a complex operation was enough, but Jimmy's operation actually took it one step further. After the BC Bud was sold in New York, much of the profits would be sent back to Canada. But, some of the profits would also be driven to airports in New York and New Jersey, loaded onto private jets, and flown to Southern California, where a Rizzuto family member was waiting to take the dirty money, and use it to buy cocaine from the Sinaloa cartel. That cocaine would then be shipped to Canada via plane, and sold on the street by the Rizzutos, who would in turn reinvest some of their profits back into Jimmy's operation. The scale of Jimmy's operation was remarkable. Here was this 20-something-year-old kid from Montreal who, as an independent operator, somehow managed to go from having 11 marijuana plants you hear these numbers, bro? from Montreal who, as Jimmy's operation was remarkable. Here was this 20-something-year-old kid from Montreal who, as an independent operator, somehow managed to go from having 11 marijuana plants at age 18, to building a billion-dollar drug empire that spanned all of North America. An almost unbelievable story, really. But Jimmy's success would also put him on the radar of the rich and famous. He developed a very close relationship with UFC star George St. Pierre, who would later describe Jimmy as his brother. His brother? George, what the fuck are you doing with him, bro? Jimmy and GSP would even fly to a visit together to celebrate Jimmy's 30th birthday. While there, they would party with A-list celebrities, including actor Leonardo DiCaprio. Jimmy made it in life. He St. Pierre's talked about it, this. I know he did a Joe Rogan, but I don't think he talked about this on Joe Rogan. He had the money, power, and respect. But what Jimmy didn't realize was that, if things seem too good to be true, it's because they actually were. That's because, for years, Jimmy had unknowingly been under a secret police investigation. Despite all the precautions Jimmy had taken, it opened. Bro, he looks like an old man, man. But he's like saying that he's 30. Yeah, I wondered this the whole video. Like, he looks like he's 50 years old, yeah, but maybe it's just the fucking. Looks like he's got gray hair and fucking. You know what I mean? But. It only took one woman to bring his billion dollar operation down. In 2007, the same year. He's a bitch, bro. A female. That Jimmy was released from prison, a woman walked into a DEA office in New York and started talking. She told agents that her ex-boyfriend was a drug dealer, and that he was working as part of a drug smuggling operation, that was bringing in massive amount- Holy, bro, that guy, whoever, bro- of marijuana into the United States. 
The DEA then started an investigation. They wiretapped her ex-boyfriend's phone, ran a sting operation on him, and got him to flip. The ex-boyfriend eventually revealed to the DEA that the op no. operation was being run by a man named Cosmo. But the DEA had no clue the Cosmo was. After a series of massive wiretap and sting operations, the DEA eventually managed to slowly piece things together. They then solved the mystery. Cosmo was Jimmy. Jimmy had used Cosmo as a nickname, which he borrowed from the luxury condo building he was living at in Montreal. While Jimmy was partying with GSP and Leonardo DiCaprio in Ibiza, the DEA had been secretly building a case against him. In January 2012, the hammer came down, and Jimmy was indicted by a Brooklyn grand jury on drug cons- Was that just me or did I see Takashi in this? I wonder why you put Takashi in this shit. Conspiracy charges. But Jimmy wasn't going to go out easy. He decided he would make a run for it, and immediately hopped on a plane to Mexico. But the US authorities were one step ahead of him. An arrest warrant had already been issued on Interpol, and, so, when Jimmy landed in Cancun, the Mexican authorities were waiting for him. He gets off the plane, and, and he's basically sort of black bagged. Uh, the Mexican authorities, uh, at the request of the Canadians, uh, just uh, grab him and, and throw him in a cell. Uh, you know, no lawyers, no ability. He kept asking to phone the Canadian embassy. Um, it was all ignored. And they tried to get him on two different planes, and he caused such a ruckus that they, the planes refused to take him. Green He's shouting, he's saying he's being kidnapped, he's, uh, he's fighting. Um, at one point he's uh, in, a, in a room, in a waiting room, um, try, about to board, and he sees a, he sees a phone, and, he, and he, when the guard's not looking, he grabs the phone, he phones the Canadian Embassy, and he starts blurting out, I'm being kidnapped, help, I'm a Canadian, I'm being kidnapped. Despite Jimmy's protests, the Mexicans put a black hat over his head, and threw him on a plane headed to Houston. It was all over. In 2013, Jimmy would plead guilty to a slew of charges, including being the leader of well, you put in there for no reason. a continuing criminal enterprise, after almost all his friends and associates cooperated with the government against him. Jimmy was then sentenced to 27 years in prison, with US prosecutors warning that, despite the length of Jimmy's sentence, it would only be a matter of time before Jimmy returns back to his usual activities, whenever he ends up being released. Subscribe to my channel, look at buddies, man. He's literally leveled right up, bro. Look at his diamonds and shit now. So funny, man. So funny, man. How literally, like, you start with nothing and then. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate you guys for watching. Thank you so much. God bless. Um, subscribe, like, comment. My name is Los Guys, Smart Chase, Scott McDonald. And uh, yeah, have a good night. Peace. Okay. Work is flawless. flawless.